Did the patient still have their right femoral artery sheath in place when you found out you needed to give lytics? Or no. Did you already pulled it, or did you close the groin? I, I closed the groin with a Vascade device. So I did a right femoral angiogram. If, the, if, the, if there's not a significant stenosis there, I usually feel comfortable with a Vascade because it's completely extravascular. I've had pretty good success with it. Um, and so she did have a closure device in place. That made me feel a bit more comfortable. I was going to say, if, if you had not, if you had pulled the sheath and held manual pressure, what would you have done for this lady? Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess um, if she, you know, she was having a lot of uh, rest pain, I guess if I felt that it wasn't an acute limb that was threatened, um, you could have waited. Uh, you could have tried heparin overnight. Maybe that's a little safer and see if that clears up a little bit. Um, but I felt that right groin was not going to be an issue. So we got, for fortunately, it was not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Justin, that was a, a really nicely presented case. And uh, it's uh, nice how you sort of outlined your decision-making process. Uh, because, you know, whether it's surgery or endovascular treatments, like you do enough uh, high-risk cases like these, troubles occur, and, and how you manage them, I think, dictates, uh, you know, the outcomes every bit as importantly as recognizing the problems we begin with. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, it, we have this happen fairly commonly, too, where there's uh, sort of some endovascular complication and the foot is somewhat compromised, and, you know, the, my, my partner calls this a, you know, the chili flipper as opposed to the completely cold leg, where it's, it's worse than when you started, and you say, well, gosh, do I go to surgery? now do I lice the patient yep. uh, knowing that you know lysis often gives you the sort of the storm before the calm where they get even a little worse when you put the lysis catheter in uh, you know what was your uh, what level of monitoring to give those patients over the course of the evening? Because, you know, at, I know at our institution, we've had to go both ways where you come around in the morning and things are better, but sometimes, well, you know, we've had the experience of coming by in the morning and things are worse and potentially even unrecognized and might lead to an amputation. Uh, so what do, you, what do you do to monitor that patient overnight? So um, we did um, very frequent vascular checks. Um, we did, since we did run it overnight, we did check fibrinogen levels, things to make sure that the lytic was not causing a problem, but it was very low dose. Um, and with a, with a lytic case like this, you probably could get away with just a couple hours or a few hours of, uh, of lytic um, through the ECOS catheter um, or through another way of, of delivering lytics. There are a few different options, obviously. Um, but we just we did very frequent vascular checks. The patient improved clinically right away, mm. and her Doppler signals came back fairly quickly. So, um, you know, we felt that just monitoring her overnight with, with frequent checks was sufficient. Uh, and then checking labs to make sure your lytics aren't causing a systemic problem. Sure. Justin, that's a, a great case. I think the, the biggest issue on that patient to start off with is that your profunda was occluded in the midsection. And when Chris and I were just talking about it, and that's when that patient gets in the trouble. Yep. So I think, you know, uh, I think it's always a good option to invo involve your surgeons. Um, I, I probably would have gone to pair across the, the CFA uh, with some wire protection, but I, I think it's it's a, another available option. I think having an open, collaborative, working relationship with your surgeons is critical. Yeah, Dr. Cashin. Dr. Cashin. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, uh, Justin Peter, great cases. Uh, uh, boy, if those are your disasters, come to my practice. I can show you some <laughs> real disasters. Uh, but my question for you is uh, the value of CTA, especially, Peter, in aortic iliac disease. I'm pretty liberal about getting CTAs on those patients just to, A, rule out aneurysm, and sometimes that calcific disease, which on a luminogram looks very focal, is actually extending up to the aorta. Any comments on that? I, I agree with you, you know, 100%. So um, if someone has a fairly normal creatinine, the only situation where we usually use CTA is in where we're expecting significant um, iliac or aortic disease for a couple of reasons. Um, one is as you're guiding the procedure, you're knowing where to access what types of devices, even potentially making sure you have appropriate sizes of covered stents that are on the shelf in preparation. Two, in situations where if you can't cross and then you start talking to, for me, my vascular surgery colleagues, it's nice to have that three-dimensional reconstruction for decision-making about what our options are post. Also, it just gives you a sense as to what's there with regards to thrombus burden in the aorta, which sometimes changes your decision making. So if I have something approaching a normal creatinine, I, that, that's the one situation where I'll always make sure we do have um, a, a CTA. And we, we guide that with our non-invasive testing. So if someone has monophasic uh, common femorals on one side or another, and we think that's going to be the bulk of our uh, intervention as iliac work, that's where we'll get it. Yeah, I guess my answer would be similar to that. I mean, I think... Uh, uh, you know, Medi kind of trained us to really scrutinize PVRs, and I think we we, are, we got good in, in fellowship at isolating where lesions were. But I think where I use CTAs now is similar to Peter. I think it's, uh, I think if you're looking at aortic iliac disease, 
Um, a lot of times it'll be, it'll change my procedural approach. You know, if I see something on CTA that suggests that I can approach it from a radial approach, I've been doing that more uh, recently is, is, is approach it from a radial. Um, whereas if I think groin is going to optimize my outcome, then I go, I go from a groin approach. And I'll add, you know, I think we've been trying to do, and a lot of places have been trying to do more and more kind of multidisciplinary team approach to some of these procedures. And so I, I work very collaboratively with our vascular surgery group in Austin. And oftentimes from a CTA alone, you might see those blockages where you think for some reason or another, this might be best treated either with like an endograph therapy or with a bypass surgery. And so having that decision upstream of when the patient's on the table, I think is a really good opportunity given to us by CTA. Drew has extensive experience with common femoral disease, but I just, we have a lot of people do different levels of procedures. It's important to point out that not stenting the common femoral artery with the superior is actually a perfectly reasonable alternative. And the option shown here by the speaker, in my opinion, is actually quite reasonable. I have a question for Peter. You know, the, uh, I, I enjoyed your case presentations and challenging iliacs like that. There's certainly a lot of, uh, you showed some good decision making in there. My question is, you know, the, you know, the advantage of, of bare metal stents in that, you know, you already ruptured the iliac once. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if, if you are, is, it, is it a sheath size access? Is it a delivery access? Uh, you know, because I, I got to say that, uh, and uh, you know, I'd be, I'd be wrapped, pulling the ICAST wrappers off pretty quick. So I, I, uh, was, I was thinking about that at the time we were doing it, and I was thinking about it as I was making the slides why I didn't do it, and I was thinking about it as I was walking to the podium. Or VBX? VBX. Yeah, VBX. I was thinking you'll be putting a VBX. Maybe it's before VBX. Very true. No, so it was, it was when we had VBX available on limited stock, and we didn't have the right size available for VBX, and so we had atrium ICASTs, and so um, the, the question was about atrium ICAST initial and we were really, I, I, I thought long and hard about it, particularly the actual evidence, the perforation was a little bit distal actually to where the stents dropped down. And so um, the thought process was, I was confident based on IVIS that we were really in the middle of that plaque. I mean, there's good data, just to, some data to use covered stents anyway, you know, when you're dealing with common iliacs. Because of a bit of the size mismatch between the aorta and the common iliacs and also how broad based the, um, the origin was, that's the only, the only reason why we did it, with the thought being if that perforation persisted, we would cover distally with something um, uh, covered. But even now, I don't know if that was the right thing to do, so your, your point in question is very well taken. I know Dimitri Feldman is walking away, but he's writing the Sky Consensus document on iliac stenting, so um, I don't want to drag him into the discussion. <laughs> proceed, keep but, going. Uh, keep going, Dimitri. <laughs> I actually have a question for the panelists. Speaking of lysis, I think one issue that comes up that, um, you know, we all think about getting, making sure the signals are present, uh, return of signals, function of the foot, but I think one thing that's a little more subtle and takes a little more finesse and, and perhaps um, is often overlooked, particularly for the folks who are monitoring our patients overnight, is compartment syndrome. So, um, you know, what, what, how do you guys deal with that in your institution or in your units when you're starting someone on lysis that you you know, are concerned about that, do you just uh, um, enforce education, hope that the right people are there overnight, do you monitor CKs as part of your protocols, just as a numerical value, just again, uh, in case you don't have the right people, what, what are folks' approach on that? Yeah, we use a lot of lysis in my institution because we do all the acute limb. Um, for this case, the ischemic time was, you know, so limited that the chance of reperfusion compartment syndrome was low. but. A lot of these patients come to our hospital and they've been ischemic for, you know, 12 hours sometimes um, before we uh, run lytics. And so if I have any concern about compartment syndrome, we get ortho on board immediately. We have an ortho consult up front and, and they monitor the patient for us. Um, when vascular surgery is involved, obviously they monitor their own patients, but we don't have vascular surgery involved in all of our uh, cases. So. So, question from the audience? Yeah, I have a question and a comment. The question is, everybody talking about IVAS now, that we should use, I use IVAS, but not liberally like everybody else here. So, I don't understand why should we IVAS the lumen from inside? I mean, you, when you really have calcified vessels and everything outside is abnormal, you don't have a very good image, even if you try. You have good images in veins, much better than in arteries. And most of the time, the IVAS will underestimate actually the lumen because you are IVASing the disease. So we went from IVAS, almost everybody, 
to IVAS only problematical cases. So I think IVAS is an overuse, a lot of money in it, $1,800 per use almost. And uh, this is an expense. And you know, in Ohio specifically, the government gives you how much you are costing. We are considered high cost now because we used to use all this technology and the hospital came after us and said, you need to decrease the use of many of those technologies. So this is the question about IVAS. I don't think we should um, use it liberally. The comment I have about the stent, when you do iliac stents, especially kissing balloon stents, how far you should go within the aorta. You know the disease does not start in the iliac artery. Most of the time, it's a spillover from the distal aorta or a spillover from the iliac to the aorta. How far you go with your stent? I can start. Um, so with regards to the first part of the question about IVIS, you're exactly, and I agree, we don't need to use IVIS necessarily for every procedure. There's an expanding role for invasive imaging in the coronaries the same way it is in the periphery. When it comes to iliacs, my always use is I always use it on uh, total occlusions within an iliac. And I, I use it, yes, for sizing things out, but more importantly, I use it to make sure I know exactly where I'm emerging from that occlusion. Because very commonly, as I think we've all seen, you'll cross an occlusion, your wire will cross into the aorta, you'll think maybe, okay, we entered back into the vessel within either the common iliac cuff or at the proximal aorta. In reality, you've re-entered back in the distal aorta, and you don't want to, for obvious reasons, balloon that. So in that situation, my always use is an iliac occlusions, and I'd be curious what to hear what, what other folks' thoughts are on that. With regards to how to use kissing stents um, inside iliacs, there, there's, a, I think, a broad variety of different answers with regards to that. I think um, years ago, folks were very commonly trying to overlap a significant amount and, and make sure that they were coming back into the aorta. And, um, you know, in situations where there was distal aortic disease, people were even doing and still do appropriately two stents inside one stent technique. There's expanding evaluation for in which degrees of this we should be maybe using EVAR. Talk about like an expensive uh, intervention for claudication sometimes, but that's also an option. Um, as time has progressed, I think we've we've tried to, well, some of us have, have tried to cheat further and further down into the vessel for a couple of Reasons one, you know, to provide further opportunities for repeat revascularization and getting up and over iliac bifurcations. Um, that speaks to IVIS use, though. So it's funny how one question kind of answers the other. If IVIS shows you a relatively preserved cuff with a relatively reasonable lumen, then having contralateral access and trying to drop down a stent at the ostia that'll op keep maintain open all of your future procedures, I think, is a good is, is the right idea, as opposed to just you know a centimeter of, of kissing stent back into the aorta. On each, each procedure. I'll just make a brief comment about IVIS. Uh, you know, I use IVIS very selectively in my vascular procedures because I find you size the vessel with balloons, you often are prepping the lesions, um, using self-expanding stents which are often, up, often upsized from the size of the vessel. I use it kind of selectively to, if I feel like I'm subintimal and I might, I might change my treatment option based on that. I will say as an interventional cardiologist, over the course of the past few years of my practice, I almost use IVIS 100% of the time in my coronary cases. And I know that's not 100% data driven. The data kind of supports more complex lesions and longer lesions to use IVIS. But I found that, you know, I do significantly less lesion prep and I do significantly less stenting and I use IVIS. I do, I do an IVIS run and then I do, you know, I size everything up. I know what, where my calcium is, where my plaque is, where to land my stent. I know the length of the stent and the diameter of the stent. I put one stent in and I'm done with the case versus, you know, landing in plaque, chasing your tail, putting a second stent in. You know, uh, arguably, from a cost-effectiveness standpoint, that could save money by saving on balloons and extra stents you put in that you don't get reimbursed for, et cetera. So, and I think it improves my outcomes that patients often don't come back because the, the stent is sized well in the coronary. All right. Well, obviously, some uh, spirited discussions about uh, many of these challenges that we face.